welcome to a new Harry's Garage video and today's car is the Ineos Grenadier, a car I've been itching to have a go in ever since it was first announced and it's been quite a period till we got to this stage. There was a big launch up in Scotland when they were bouncing over rocks in sort of January time. I said no, I'm going to wait until I can have it on the farm and live with it for a week. So that's why I'm now doing the test in May. But it's uh, been great to live with and I've discovered a lot about this car over that time. Just a little bit of background, I'm sure most of you know, but this is Ineos, who's uh, Jim Radcliffe, and he wanted to buy the old Defender, the original Defender off Jaguar Land Rover when they were ceasing production in 2015. They said no. He said, okay, I'll make my own. And in that period, he spent, I think, about one and a half billion pounds creating this company to produce this Grenadier, which is produced in France, as we all know, which he took over a Mercedes factory all ready to go down out there. It has BMW engines and is now hitting the market. And it's a very tough utilitarian type of car, just like the old Defender was. Let's go and have a closer look. Now I'm going to do two reviews of this car. As many of you know, I have two channels on YouTube, Harry's Farm and Harry's Garage. And for this Harry's Garage review, I'm going to refer quite a lot to the new Land Rover Defender 110 as a potential rival for this car, as well as a couple of other cars. And on the farm video, I'm going to do much more about off-road, how it works as a farm vehicle. But this is more how I see a 110 used. And obviously I had that long-term Defender as well. So kicking off with the style, well, you can see the, the influence of Defender. You sort of end up with this shape anyway when you're doing a sort of utilitarian off-road. So the big wings, flat on top, the sort of separate bonnet. And here, this really quite extended sort of um, bumper here. This actually takes in a winch, which is on the option list on the front. And then it's got intakes for cooling. I think it cools, uh, I think there's air conditioning and some other things happening in there as well, but they are sort of working. And right underneath with these great big tow hooks you'd expect to see on this car, and a chunky sort of sump guard, etc. But it doesn't actually go that far because there's a great big live axle leaping up and down just behind it. So you can't have a sort of full length sump guard under the engine because you have got that axle there as well. And it will just crucify ground clearance. So a very, um, purposeful look, shall we say, at the front. And this model, it's quite confusing how many models there are of uh, the Grenadier at the moment. They're all this size, but this is a station wagon Trial Master edition. And Trial Master means it's the off-road version. So as standard, it has the rough pack, as they term it, diff locks, front and rear, and these off-road tires and the steel wheels. You also get the snorkel as standard as well with the um, Trial Master. The other one is a Field Master, which is m more sort of posher inside and things like that. Same price. Yeah, price. I'll mention price. At least £69,000, so more than envisaged when he first, this car was first announced for this one. And to put that in perspective, a Defender 110 D250, same horsepower as this, is 61,790 on the road, before extras, both before extras, those two cars. It's big as well, it's about a foot longer than a, a Defender 110. There's a lot more space inside than the old Defender, not surprising there. And this one has these extras as well, which are the rock sliders. And these are sort of to protect the seals if you're going properly off-road. This car was actually done 4,000 miles and it was on the original launch up in Scotland. So it's a well-used example. Disc brakes at the fr front and rear, ventilator at the front. Inside trim on here we'll look more at the interior when we take it outside but just the things I wanted to show you first rubber mats and this peculiar lump where your left foot goes and that's unfortunately it's only on the right hand drive models on the left hand drive you have a normal size foot rest it's because that's where the exhaust runs on the BMW engine as a sort of catalyst sitting out under there I've also noticed this is get already getting very scratched on the sill here probably can't see in this light but uh, 
getting quite a lot of that. Well, it's got all this sort of detail, and this is all for these accessories that you bought on this car. The accessory catalogue of this car is fantastic. Hours of fun to be had there. At the back, it has, yeah, bent seat, so you can see. And I'm gonna just lift this up, because these seats don't fold flat, because all the battery and things hides under the rear seat. There's no way the seats can fold because of all that underneath. It's an unusual choice that because on the original Defender that the battery and the electrics used to be under the driver's seat but on here it's under that passenger seat. Carry on coming round. It's huge. So it's a foot longer, it's a bit taller as well and this is where it gets quite interesting because if you think on current Defender there's a tailgate one piece and you open it. It still has a spare wheel on it. On this one it's split and there's this left hand one if I open this one up and this ladder is standard on the um, trial master. I open that up to get access to the boot. It's a bit tight and it's all a bit awkward so I think most of the time you will be opening this one up and then you've got full access to the big boots in the back. Um, these, I think, are optional just so you can strap your luggage down. Little things I notice on here. I was very surprised if you look at this thing, how many screws are missing. This is a, you know, original press car. Half the screws are miss, sort of missing out the back, which seems a bit odd, a bit ominous um, for build quality, etc. But nothing has actually gone wrong while I've been having it. But one other point on this tail wire. I'm surprised at the choice, having lived with this, I wish it was more like the Isuzu Trooper that used to have the same sort of arrangement, this split tailgate. And on that car, you open the big door first and then you open the second door, the smaller door. And I think that's a better way around than this one because this one is just awkward and, and hasn't got the strut helping it and it's just hard work. And then it's not very big anyway. So you're going to end up opening both of them all the time, I would expect on that. Anyway, anything else to see around here? A little bit of protection here as well at the back. Um, again, it doesn't go all the way under. Oh, there's a camera here, which is quite useful because you can actually see that tow ball. So when I was backing up onto a trailer, I've used this for towing. You can just about see that, which is nice when you're backing onto a trailer. Right, let's have a quick look at the engine. Yeah, it's got no struts holding this up on this one. You have to use this. There we are. BMW engines, it would look near identical if it was petrol or diesel. As I said before, this is the diesel version. The petrol version, more horsepower, less torque, as you expect, 286 horsepower versus 249 for this. And that makes it more accelerative. So I think it's 8.6, 0-62. And on the diesel version, it's 9.9 .9 seconds, which compared to the Defender 110 D250, it does it in eight seconds a fair difference but then this grenadier weighs a chunk more if i i put this actually over the way bridge and with me in it it went 2960 kilos i'm about 80 kilos so 2880 but it does have those um, rock crawl protector bars at the side but if i look at the defender 110 that weighs 2,241. So this is nearly, well, 600 kilos heavier than the current Defender. Anyway, let's take it outside, go through the interior, and then take it for a drive. Oh, this door. Yeah, it needs a proper slam to close properly. Same with the passenger side, not sure why. And yeah, get in and the first shock well, there's no dial in front of me there's just this screen here that controls everything right in front of the wheel if i turn it on i'm not going to do it just yet all the warning lights all come up that's where they are there's this sort of tray here you're meant to put something on but i think everything will just slide off it really it doesn't look as though it's very secure big door pockets in there i think your mobile phone or something goes here there's no sort of charging pad or anything like that glove box i can see yeah space generally and they call this a locking yeah where's the key yeah this is a, a locking center console here so in here but um you know it's the ye old key it's one of those keys that you don't really see i wonder what that key was for it's like for a petrol cap or something but actually it's to lock this up Two cup holders, big handbrake, things like that. Just to 
get everything working. Now, what you do? Yeah, rear wiper is on. Why is the rear wiper on? Is my five-year-old grandson done something that I don't know? No, there's a little rocker switch on the wiper blade at the end. Right. Anyway, where was I? Yes, you're faced with this. Speedo is now here. It defaults to home that gives you your, what radio you're listening to there. This thing is a altitude is 369 feet here. I'm heading in 56 degrees. So it's a compass. You think it's a clock, but no, it's not a clock. Clock is just up there. Um, a very distinctive BMW gear changer, all automatic, all grenadiers. You all use the same right, drivetrain apart from petrol diesel. And a big proper gear lever for um, high and low range and for locking the centre diff. Lots of buttons to control things on here. As I say, my grandson Henry thinks this is the best car in the world because of all this and all in the roof as well. These are your sort of day-to-day -day stuff here, climate control, uh, heated screens and things. You can turn the stop start on and off so it doesn't do it, which is good. And then up here, your sort of occasional lights that you might use so the interior lights but there is this off-road mode down here and if you wear glasses you're sort of struggling because you're trying to see what you're actually doing and these are off-road mode here wading uh, these are the diff locks here and then these other switches well they're just auxiliary switches should you fit sort of flashing lights on top or have that tent option and you might have some power you require for that for fridges or something like that so that is very occasional you know recreational use these are actually ones you might use. Sun visors both sides no mirrors at all in this one. There's just obviously a very utilitarian feel. You don't think this is a 70 something thousand pound car. I'm, I'm almost not going to mention the price because everything is expensive. I'm saying oh it's just very expensive. My friend's just shown me his new Golf R and it was 59,000 pounds. Who thought you'd get a Golf there? Um, so back digress. I I like to go say off-road have those on there so I can see fuel consumption it does it on there but it defaults back to that home screen every time anyway oh wheel um, cruise control this side and volume this side something I'm going to mention on the steering and I am on gravel so don't panic it's a lot of turns a lot to lock so if I start there one two three nearly four turns three and three quarter turns are lock to lock and yet the turning circle 13 and a half meters that is not good the original defender 110 that was bad enough at 12.8 meter turning circle lock to lock but this is 13.5 i think i've got the figure for the new defender yeah, new Defender, 11.3 metres turning circle and 2.7 turns lock to lock. And you do notice that, which I'll come to when I go down here. Anyway, let's head out, head out some testing bits of road. I don't know if you can hear that, but there is this resonance, this sort of old style sort of diesel vibration coming from somewhere deep below. I don't know if there's a sort of heat shield or something like that. And then we have to slow steer it, so I don't know how many locks to put on. And then yeah, you have to put it put it back. There we are, up to 60 miles an hour. I mean, it's, it's a grunty engine, it, it's working hard and you know it's working because you can hear it but it does give it a yeah, reasonable step off as you saw there but it's just this weird steering, it's the rollerball steering on this car and they've done that because that's what old Defender had and you means when you're off-road and there's rocks around you don't get any kickback through the steering wheel, that's the positive. The negatives is you also don't get a lot of feel and it doesn't have hardly any self-centering action so you actually have to wind it back to go straight ahead and I would have thought if you're using it on road it's a bit of a pain to me that for that one advantage of less kickback when you're going off road but anyway that's just me also measure it noisy bit of road and it's quite noisy this car we were around 80 
486 decibels um, which is because it's a van and it's a big open box and there's a noisy six cylinder diesel up the front and sort of noisy off-road tires all combined to make it quite noisy in here and then you've got a nice blind spot here because the B pillar is enormous and it's just where you sit if you're six foot tall Oh dear me, yeah I can't wait to get out onto the open road, uh, I have to say sort of urban travel in this isn't its star turn at all, it's easy because it's automatic but the very slow steering, heaven forbid doing a three point turn it will soon turn into a six point turn but yeah let's get it back onto the open road so I think it would be a bit happier. It's interesting this dash layout, obviously speed there, rev counter is just this bar graph along there and fuel and gearbox, what gear I'm in here temperature so 4200 miles this car's done yeah and half a tank but 141 mile range remaining yeah it, it has used a fair bit of fuel but then I did do that towing with it which was interesting to do I'm just going to try and go through this track one shot as I turn around there there wasn't as much roll as you might expect and I'm pretty sure that's its sort of drivetrain layout the fact that it's got those live axles and the um, chassis underneath holding them all together means there's a lot of weight down below and even though it's got a big metal box sitting on top the majority of the weight is set fairly low now this is my lumpy bit of road generally it rides pretty well but this is Live axles do not like our sort of B roads like this. You can just feel things jiggling around underneath. You're not feeling it through the steering as such, but you just know there's very big things, bits of iron jumping up and down. But yeah, ride is it's good <laughs> superficially if you were to measure it because it's got these big squashy tyres and all the rest of it. Big flat screen, you saw that bug hit it. It's just like a G Wagon, which used to get lots of bugs splattered against the windscreen because it's like it's not actually dead flat but it's almost dead flat and upright and visibility out it's it's yeah letterbox at the front looks good square corners and amazing I can't see that snorkel at all but in out the back it's a very confused picture obviously because the split tailgate and then the spare wheel and that's mounted quite high so you, you, cars sort of coming up behind you disappear then you well, you haven't got access to the camera but when you're manoeuvring you can see via that it, it's you, you are very reliant on the parking sensors when you go park this thing but it's just the amount of steering i'm actually putting through the wheel because of the sort of low gearing of the steering and also i've noticed this seat position i think i think um Ineos would prefer if i was a monopod but my left leg is a bit of a nuisance on this and I found over long distance, I actually get pins and needles in my foot just because you can't move it, you have nowhere to put it and it's at a different angle to your right leg that's got things to do with two pedals to operate. But you sort of bowl along as you can see here. Brakes feel okay actually. Uh, the thing is this has a gross train rated weight of 6,700 kilos. So unladen, well you'd imagine the brakes to be pretty good and they are. It should roll more than that, but it doesn't. Uh, so it's one of the advantages of the ladder frame chassis and those big axles. So, you, yeah, you can generally eat miles in this. If this is a left-hand drive, I would say, yeah, it's probably quite a nice place to do miles in, but just right-hand drive because of this driving position, not so good. of the steering and the live axle feel it just gives it a slightly cumbersome feel about it but I hark back to original Defender and you can very much say the same about that car so if you're trying to replicate old Defender yeah, you've done a good job but there's more space in it so that's a sort of positive for it and it and it just has brought it up to date with the interior of things and the finally the space and all defenders were improved by being automatic and this being automatic is a big plus. I went towing with it 
because I thought, well, that's the sort of job I would expect this car to do, and it handled it okay. But when I put the car in the trailer loaded, uh, only I put my Project Seven in, which is just over 1,500 kilos. That gave me a train weight when I went on the Weybridge. It was four and a half tons unladen with trailer, so I would have been near six tons, about 6.1 tons, and I felt the weight at that sort of level. The engine was working hard, and the slight vagueness, and thought, hmm, I've got a lot of weight on board here. Anyway, let's just put it through my corners. Yeah, I've no, I've nothing through the steering into there, what's happening underneath, anything flashing, but, you know, there's no traction control, but I did have to put it out of that bend. I mean, yeah, it, you will bowl along quite happily, I'll give it that, it is better handling for, because of its lack of roll than I expected. Yeah, just going back to the towing, uh, and also the other thing about the weight, I, I checked the fuel consumption and it was between 17 and 19 mpg with the trailer behind, depending on whether it was loaded or unloaded. So yeah, but yeah, you can't defy physics, if you've got that amount of weight, well you're going to use fuel. Moving on to some of the things I like about it, well, one, it exists, hats off to Sir Jim Radcliffe to taking on such a project. It is not easy making a car today, but he's done it, and he's created a brand, and he's come out of a car. And I love the fact it's sort of different, and you can clamber in and think, oh, what's all this, all the switch gear, etc. It's it's just fun, that part of it, and the accessories you can get for this car, where you can lose yourself. It's like Harley Davidson, and all the things you can do with a Harley Davidson. It's a slightly product perhaps but look what you can make it yours and I think that's the appeal on this Ineos but it is one man's vision of what a defender should be and for me I can't say I share the same vision I think the world has moved on and there are VW Amarok um, all sorts of G, G wagon and obviously new Defender, have all shown you can have really good off-road ability, but car-like dynamics and the, you know, a rack and pinion steering and just a, a car feel to, to an off-roader that can also play a commercial role should you want it to. And I don't want to be reminded of rollerball steering, live axles jumping up and down. So I don't share the same vision to how I think these cars are used and they're multi-purpose cars. The on-road performance of this car is just way off where I expect a 2023 car to be. Maybe if I want, I want the utilitarian version of this, I would like to try the pickup version. I wish he'd done a sort of Africa version back to basics, but I suppose that's not where the money is. You need to appeal to the EU type buyer or American buyer. They have their uh, pickups and they're a very developed market, so that's going to be a hard one to crack as well. So, yeah, there's my conclusion on this car. I think it misses completely. If I was in the market for this type of vehicle, I would go straight to Land Rover's door with Defender. I like the Jeep Wrangler as well, Renegade, or, um, because that's a back to basics car, but it only comes four cylinder petrol engine. It doesn't have the tow capacity of this three and a half ton this has, so it's not as substantial as this. And this will have to prove itself to be super tough. You get a long warranty, it's five year warranty on it, but the toughness hasn't been proven yet because it's only just come out. If it gets that tough reputation in outbacks, in exodus, you know, people use it for the camping, everything that the brochure types offer, uh, offer um, then maybe that's, that's where it will score. But it's a niche within a niche, really. And I think as a road car, as a Harry's Garage car, it misses it on the target. Maybe it will appeal more on the Harry's Farm video and what I'm looking for for as a farmer, but to find out you'll have to watch that video. But for the meantime, that's my review of the Ineos Grenadier. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, well, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming on very soon.